Can I get a witness? Paul asks the Corinthian congregation. We are 15 chapters into the letter. Well, Paul didn't include chapter numbers. Those are for us. But we're almost to the end of this very long letter. And Paul finally gets to what he says is of first importance. Let me remind you, he says, of the gospel, the good news. This is the story in which you stand. This is the proclamation by which you are being saved. This is the truth you must hold on to, unless, of course, your belief is for nothing, Paul says. Can I get a witness that Christ died, that Christ was buried, that Christ was raised? Whatever else Paul has gone on about, this is what he says is crucial. The Corinthians are tempted to philosophize Jesus' story, to spiritualize the gospel, to take it out of its historical context, its flesh and blood, and to universalize principles of God's love and protection through Jesus. Just another demigod to add to their list of deities to revere. But Paul says no. <laughs> He insists on the flesh and blood, the history, the uncomfortable and unbelievable story of crucifixion, burial, and bodily resurrection. And he trots out his witnesses, right? Cephas saw him. That's the Greek name for Peter. Cephas saw him and the twelve. The resurrected Jesus appeared to more than 500 people all at once. You can ask them yourselves if you can get to Jerusalem. He was there with James and with all the apostles you've heard about. This isn't some myth passed down through the centuries. It's not some story with a moral at the end. This is flesh and blood. This is resurrection. We've seen it with our own eyes, Paul says. Stories of resurrection cry out to be told, to be witnessed. I rise, I rise, I rise, says Maya Angelou. She demands to be seen in her poem, Still I Rise, which you heard Edith read earlier in the service so powerfully. Thank you, Edith. But it's not just resurrection that needs a witness. Paul's story isn't just a story of resurrection any more than Maya Angelou's poem is. It's equally a story of harm, of violence, of oppression. Bishop William Barber once said that every crucifixion needs a witness. In an interview in the Boston Review, he spoke about the weekly Moral Monday protest that he has led since 2013. It began with Barber and other clergy in peaceful protest at the North Carolina legislature each week, ending in their arrest each week. And it has expanded to a nationwide movement in the Poor People's Campaign, which came to the Austin State House last summer. We had the honor of hosting Reverend Barber and the marchers here at UBC. And many of us marched and rallied with them. The movement began and continues even now because, as Reverend Barber says, we decided then that if they were going to crucify the poor, crucify women, crucify children, crucify the sick, every crucifixion needs a witness. We've got to tell the whole story. It's the whole of the story that saves us. Not just the hope of resurrection, but the reality of sin and death in our midst. This is of first importance, Paul says, that Jesus died, was buried, and was raised. In Still I Rise, we witness not just the rising and dancing and hope and sassiness of a black woman, we also witness the bitterness and lies, the hate and racism and pain that she is beset by. There is power in bearing witness to the whole story. It's what saves us. It's what transforms us. There are plenty of churches 
that preach hope of resurrection while trampling the poor all around them. Churches that sing about a heavenly escape while leaving the world to burn. And there are plenty of churches that preach a gospel of guilt and shame, crucifixion and death without God's love and promise of abundance. But Paul insists that the gospel, the good news, is the whole story, all of it. This is where we find our firm footing. It's how we are being saved, no matter how complex, how uncomfortable the story is. And the story is uncomfortable. Most of all for Paul, perhaps, who lists himself as last in his litany of witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, Paul writes. The word untimely born isn't about being born at the wrong time, as if he was born too late to be a part of the original group of apostles. The word there is a medical term for a miscarriage or a stillbirth. Paul is saying, I was dead. I was dead in my sin, and I was dealing death when Jesus appeared to me. If you remember Paul's story, you know that he comes into the biblical narrative as an enemy, as a persecutor, tracking down and stamping out those earliest Christ followers. He was there at the first recorded martyrdom in the book of Acts, the stoning of Stephen. He believes that he is protecting his religion and his God until he comes face to face with Jesus on the Damascus Road, you remember? A heavenly light flashes around him. He falls to the ground and hears Jesus ask, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why are you hurting me? Paul is transformed from persecutor to pastor because Jesus tells him the truth about himself. He writes to the Corinthians, I am least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I've persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Jesus' resurrection is not the only one that Paul bears witness to in his letter. But Paul can only preach the gospel with any authenticity, with any legitimacy, because he meets Jesus, and Jesus tells him the truth. He sees the truth about himself. He sees the truth of the whole story and the part that he has played in it. And I think that's what we see when we encounter Jesus, too. Maybe... For many of us, still I rise is our Damascus road where we are confronted with our complicity in sin or a reminder of that Damascus road anyway, where we come to face to face with the truth of our whole story, our whole part in it, the racism of our ancestors, our own culpability in racist systems, of sin that persist and intertwine our lives every day, our willful ignorance of so much sin and death in our world. For white Christians, with a legacy of oppression, Jesus tells us the truth through Maya Angelou and through William Barber and the Poor People's Campaign and through the Black Lives Matter movement and through the testimony of black siblings in our church community, thanks be to God. What will we do with that truth? Will we suppress it and continue to protect our own self-image, our own security, our own comforts? Or will we be transformed? Will we be saved? Will we find our firm footing in the whole story? Beloveds, will we face the truth and be saved. Can I get a witness? Amen.